When the porcupine senses danger, it raises its quills. If this does not work, the animal begins to hiss, clatter its teeth, shake its quills, and advance on the enemy. Predators know it's better to retreat from a defensive porcupine and wait for a better moment. But they do not realize that when the porcupine is calm, it can be even more dangerous. Have you heard of Aristotle? This ancient Greek philosopher knew a lot of different subjects, including zoology, and claimed it was dangerous to approach porcupines. Allegedly, these animals could shoot their deadly needle-like darts over great distances. I don't know if any of contemporaries listened to Aristotle, but hey, there must have been a reason they call him the father of zoology, the father of biology, the father of the scientific method. In short, Aristotle was quite a prolific father. The man with so many titles should know a thing or two about porcupines. But the real life turned out to be slightly different from what the famous philosopher imagined. Well, it's simply impossible to know everything, especially when you live in the 4th century BC. In general, Aristotle was right. Porcupines really know how to shoot their quills, they just do it randomly and don't try to aim at enemies. How do you even aim sideways? Or with your back? Porcupines have quills almost everywhere on their bodies, and they can all be used for protection. When the porcupine senses danger, it raises the projectiles to an upright position, waggles, then lashes its tail. At this time, some of the older quills, which the animal was ready to shed, can dislodge and fly away in any direction. Whether the quills stick into the enemy or not is a matter of chance, but since the ancient Greeks already noticed this could happen, one might wonder why predators keep hunting porcupines, if it's really that dangerous. And I'm not talking about humans, we love to take risks. You know, skydiving, eating at questionable roadside cafes. But what about lions? Well, it looks like lions just love food. It's hard to blame them for this. In the wilderness, food means survival. And when there's a lack of usual prey, for example, during a drought, lions have to look for other options. Sometimes they start hunting humans, and sometimes they attack porcupines. Studies have shown that in areas with little rainfall, porcupines make up on average 28% of the diet of big cats, while in wetter areas, they usually make up less than 4% of their menu. In general, this is definitely not a favorite food of lions. The danger's too big. Nobody wants to pull the quills out of the face and risk their health if they can eat some antelope. However, try explaining this to young lions. They can easily attack a porcupine even when there's other prey. Well, why is he walking around here like that? Don't go in there, Steve. You remember what your dad said? Come on, relax. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> How do such encounters end? In most cases, not good. According to scientists who have gathered data on interactions between lions and porcupines, per 40 cases where lions were seriously injured, there are another 10 instances where they were instantly killed. This can happen when quills pierce the heart or large arteries, but when you look at the porcupine, it doesn't strike you as a cold-blooded killer. He's more like a funny beaver with quills. But even if the quill does not hit a vital organ, it can still kill the animal. Not because porcupines are covered with some kind of poison. Fortunately, nature did not think of this. However, they are not exactly sterile, which means that once in the body, the quill can carry infection or transmit some disease the porcupine carries, including rabies. In addition, the quills have a strange habit of traveling inside on their own and at a fairly high speed, about one inch per day. I'm not saying, of course, that a quill that gets into a hind leg can come out through the ear, but it's quite capable of getting so deep it becomes impossible to remove it. Hold on. When I come across such a dangerous animal, I always wonder why the quills don't harm the porcupine. They are long, tough, keep falling out, which means they can easily stick back into their owner. Moreover, porcupines fall from trees quite often. So why didn't they go extinct due to accidental self-injuries? It may seem incredible, but for the porcupine, the quills have antibiotic properties. They appear to be coated in free fatty acids, which have this effect. So even if a porcupine is injured, it'll easily avoid infection. In fact, this animal carries an entire first aid kit on its back, and the necessary medications are self-injected. Convenient. But back to the lions. Imagine the quill ended up in its body. Is it possible to get it out? If we were talking about a dog, the owner would simply take it to the vet who has a sedative, special tools, and comforting treats. But what should a wild animal do? Only hope that some of his kin will help. 
If this is not a lone lion, then someone from the pride will rid him of the quills, though this procedure is hardly pleasant. Just don't pull right away, okay? On the count of three, okay? As you wish. Three! Ow! When the quills are removed, it's time to tend to the wounds. Unless you're a human, or porcupine, you have no access to a first aid kit, so you have to handle this on your own. Lick the damaged area. This is a reflexive impulse, and you probably caught yourself doing it too, but it's not just the instincts nature gave us. Saliva really helps. It contains a protein and a complex of phospholipids which accelerate blood clotting, and at the same time attack bacteria and ensure protection against infection. Well, there is always a risk of transmitting bacteria from the mouth into the wound, but what can you do? Does this mean saliva can be used for medical purposes? Well, I wouldn't recommend it. It's one thing to quickly lick a scratch on your finger, and quite another to use saliva as a substitute for medication. However, in ancient Greece, people were more careless and even used dogs for healing rituals. Asclepius, the god of medicine, was frequently depicted with a dog, and so these animals often lived at the Asclepians, healing temples. But they didn't just stick around chasing sticks, the dogs took part in the rituals and in the healing process. They licked the wounds of the patients. I'm being serious. Okay, lick your right hand three times a day for a week, then come again. Can I have another doctor? Was this treatment helpful? Maybe. But in any case, if you allow your pet to lick the damaged areas of your skin, the likelihood of catching some kind of infection from the dog is much higher than if you do not allow doing this, even if it is a dog from the sanctuary of Asclepius, even if it has a doctor's degree. So you probably already realized it's better not to disturb porcupines, let alone mess with them. However, there is a time when even the calmest and happiest porcupine can be deadly. This is the period of active shedding. It usually happens at the end of May. Imagine the quills are already quite loose. And when the animal prepares to get rid of the winter undercoat, it looks like an explosive shell. The good news is that porcupines are slow and do not often make sudden moves. The bad news is they can easily shake during the shedding period and we already know what'll happen next. Again? Wait, if the quills are so loose, does that mean the porcupine can just run out of them? Well, the porcupine will have to try hard for that. Researchers estimate this animal has more than 30,000 quills, and it'll take a really long time to get rid of all of them. Plus, new quills are growing at an alarming rate. Take human hair for comparison. On average, it grows by 0.02 inches per day. Porcupine quills grow roughly twice as fast, and they grow and fall out unevenly. That is, longer ones are sent flying then get immediately replaced with the new ones, while medium-length quills also keep growing. In short, you get the idea. I think you don't have to worry about the animal losing its protection. But why are the quills actually so sharp? Compared to hedgehog quills, these are huge, deadly spears that can't be pulled out without feeling discomfort. Well, actually, porcupine quills are very hard hair. They're also made of keratin, a protein that makes up our hair. But in the case of porcupines, it's more upgraded, in a manner of speaking. If you've seen what human hair looks like under a microscope, you know it's covered with scales. Porcupine quills are similar, though they rather have backward-facing barbs. They are positioned in such a way that the quills can easily pierce the skin, but it takes a lot of effort to remove them. This explains why dogs need the help of a vet after getting too close to a porcupine. Evolution has literally armed porcupines with the perfect melee and ranged weapon. What if there were not the goblins who killed the dwarves of Moria? Porcupines. Actually, there is some truth in this. While people still used arrows as weapons, they learned how to make two types of arrowheads. The first ones are smoother, so that they can pierce the armor without losing momentum along the way, and the second ones had prongs. You see them every day, because this is what the mouse cursor looks like. But few people wonder what was the purpose of these protrusions. They work the same way as the barbs of the porcupine quills, making it impossible to pull the arrow out of the wounded. Well, over time, people have learned to cope even with such problems. But this is a story for another time. See you later.